Because the Egyptians understood that the subtle bodies were conscious and could be communicated with, that meant they understood that they could also be programmed, and those that we normally cast off after death could be preserved for other purposes. That's why in the Egyptian tombs, you will find in the back of the tomb a kind of false door with a hole cut in it. And in the Egyptian text, they call that a ka hole, because that's what the ka, or life body, is supposed to move through. So the initiate understands that if you understand the way that your own subtle bodies and energy centers are set up, you can then tap into any spiritual power in the universe or any piece of knowledge that you need to attain by knowing where to tap into your own structure. This is a very high attainment that only a fairly small number of initiates have fully attained. What is the way that the human being is put together? What's our structural format on which all of our initiation practices will be built? Because initiation practices are built in knowing, for example, what subtle body of the human being we're interacting with, or what energy center needs to be activated for us to perform certain functions of higher consciousness or certain practical spiritual activities in the world. And so we've broken this up into two parts. The first part that we're just going to get into right now is the aspect of the structure of the human being that is related to the systems of the subtle bodies. How many subtle bodies do we have and what are their particular functions? The subtle bodies of the human being are in fact detachments from higher planes. So if we talk about the physical plane, the human physical body is a detachment from the physical plane that's given to an individual human spirit to become our physical vehicle during our earthly life. After death, when the spirit leaves, the physical body goes back to the physical earth that it came from. And we describe the way this is true for all of the higher bodies. The etheric life body that we have is a detachment from the universal life force, what the Chinese call the universal chi field, that we bring into our life, into our physical body, to animate it with life during our physical human lifetime. And this body of life force is what was depicted in the Egyptian tradition when they had the ram-headed netter named Hanum working on a potter's wheel and forming a kind of duplicate of the human physical body that we would call today the etheric double and that they called the ka, something that had the form of the human being's body that would be put into the body and would animate it with life forces. The astral plane is something you hear a lot about in modern metaphysical studies. It's basically the first true consciousness level of higher planes. And so we have an astral body, and our astral body is a detachment from the astral plane to become our consciousness body. And so we described earlier that all of these different subtle bodies are taken from the planes of existence around us. So we have all the spiritual planes inside of us. This is the classical spiritual teaching that the human being is the crown of creation and the Hermetic teaching, as above, so below, we have reflected into us all of the higher principles and even the higher planes in our own structure. So the initiate understands that if you understand the way that your own subtle bodies and energy centers are set up, you can then tap into any spiritual power in the universe or any piece of knowledge that you need to attain by knowing where to tap into your own structure. So that's a foundation for what we're about to get into right now. We also described in class one that the real source of these spiritual planes and the subtle bodies is in fact the universal body of the Godhead, the One, as the Greeks referred to that unity being behind all of existence. And so from that perspective, classical traditions understand that if we talk about the mental body of the human being and the mental plane in the higher worlds, that's actually the mind of God spread out in the world, because there's nothing else that could be a foundation for that level. And so the physical plane in our physical body are all parts of the physical body of God. So all the different planes, all of our subtle bodies are parts of the body of God at its different levels. And at the highest level of unity, it becomes the unified Godhead, the One, Brahma, the uh, Wu Ji, many different names and different traditions for that unified source of all creation. One of the first things we want to bring out is that there are different systems of subtle bodies that are taught by different spiritual traditions. 
And that's because they are, in these different traditions, intentionally structuring the subtle bodies of their initiates in different ways. This is a very important principle for us. You will not get the same structures in your energetic and consciousness bodies training with let's say a given school in the east that you might get training with a given school in the west even in different schools in the east and west are not the same as other schools even within that general tradition because everything that we do with our consciousness every thought every emotion every feeling that we have has an effect on our structure and so what practices you're given to do by the spiritual tradition that you work with will create very different activations of energy centers and different energy movements between these energy centers, which will create different structures, literally, in your energy body. And that will structure your consciousness. So, connected to this idea that different practices will structure human beings differently, and this is taken advantage of in the different systems of different traditions, the same thing is true for how we understand the structure of the spiritual realities that we're working with. So, if we are working in a system that has five different subtle bodies, that's going to make possible different types of practical work than a tradition that teaches three subtle bodies, or four, or seven. And following up this concept further, we can see an example from the Egyptian mysteries. And in the Egyptian mysteries, we can see that uh, they had a particular understanding of the subtle bodies that's quite different than what we have, for example, in modern Western metaphysics. In modern Western metaphysics, we'll talk about something like the human physical body, the etheric life body, the astral body of consciousness. And these are like things that are a part of the human being, but they're not described in such a way that we understand them as being separate beings in themselves. We don't tend to describe in the West today that your physical body, your etheric life body, your astral body are themselves separate conscious beings. But in ancient Egypt, this was understood. Now, by understanding the subtle bodies from this perspective, it then opened up possibilities to them of particular types of practical spiritual work that would not have been obvious if they had seen it from a different perspective. So, for example, as we describe in our classes, in the biogeometry system created by Dr. Ibrahim Karim from Cairo, Egypt. We describe in the foundation training of biogeometry the way that the ancient Egyptian priesthood understood that the life body of the human being, that we call in the West the etheric body, and that the Egyptians called the Ka, because it had its own separate level of consciousness, but that consciousness was not highly developed, the actual life body of the human being that normally, after death, will leave the physical body and then break up and go back to the universal life energy, the universal chi field, that life body could actually be preserved from breaking up and maintained coherent on the earth for particular purposes by the priesthood. And one of those purposes would be that it could be used to protect the tomb of the deceased person after death. That's why in the Egyptian tombs, you will find in the back of the tomb a kind of false door with a hole cut in it. And in the Egyptian text, they call that a ka hole, because that's what the ka, or life body, is supposed to move through. And on the other side of that false door, in the back of the tomb, is a wooden statue that has the same form as the physical body of the person that has just died. Because that is what the life energy body is used to resting within, the correctly shaped form of the physical body. And so, all these types of mysteries, as we described in the biogeometry training, become much more easily understood once we understand these frames of reference. Because the Egyptians understood that the subtle bodies were conscious and could be communicated with, that meant they understood that they could also be programmed. And those that we normally cast off after death could be preserved for other purposes. So we're not going to go further down that road right now. We're just going to say that's an example of what we're talking about. Seeing the subtle bodies from different perspectives will allow you to take different types of practical spiritual activities, learn new types of skills that would not have been obvious seeing these realities from a different perspective. And again, doing practices that's based on these different perspectives will structure your subtle bodies in different ways. Now where we want to start with, with our study of the subtle bodies of the human being in the different tradition, is the tradition that comes from India. 
So with the Indian tradition, we have a system of five, what they call sheaths. And this in Sanskrit is called the koshas. Now they call them the sheaths, the koshas, because they see the subtle bodies, including the physical body, as essentially a sheath or a vehicle that the true self of the person, the Atman of the person, uh, can then incarnate into and use as the sheaths for the spirit to act through in the physical world during their earthly life. So this Indian uh, Vedantic system of the five koshas begins at the highest level with what they call the sheath of bliss. This is the Ananda Maya Kosha, and it's called the sheath of bliss because this particular sheath that is around the human spirit core, which again, in some parts of the Indian tradition, they call the Atman, and other parts of the Indian tradition, they give it other names. But in this particular Vedantic system, they will call it the Atman. And so around that core of the human spiritual essence, which is itself a very blissful state of consciousness when you connect to your spiritual core, around that is a sheath of energy, the Anandamaya Kosha, the sheath of bliss, that itself, when you connect to it, has a blissful state of consciousness with it. Some sources associate this sheath with what's referred to in the West as the causal body. And causal body means that this is the essential part of ourselves that creates a type of a pattern for our life on Earth. It creates causes in our life on Earth. In the deeper parts of the Indian tradition, the causal body is connected to the idea of karma. Karma is the law of cause and effect. The things you have done in the past create structures in your energy field. They create particular types of karmic attachments that are going to play out in your life. So certain things are built into the structure of these higher subtle bodies that then manifest your karma in the world. So that's one aspect of this idea uh, of the causal body, which again, some Indian sources associate with this sheath of bliss, the Anandamaya Kosha. Now to really understand this at a deeper level, there's a very beautiful frame of reference that's given in the Indian tradition with the interplay between the two primal polarities of Shiva and Shakti. And all types of practical energetic work in the human body and with the work an initiate can do with the energetics in the world around us are based on the interplay of this ultimate consciousness of Shiva and the ultimate energy of Shakti. So these are two primal polarities, masculine, feminine, positive, negative, consciousness and energy in their interplay. And in the discussion in the Indian tradition about this, they describe the way that these two forces interplay in a sense as lovers playing a game. And from that perspective, Shiva is always in the center. Shiva is in some ways the principle of the center, where everything is always connected to the divine. Everything's already connected to that blissful state of ultimate essence. And so Shakti wants to play a game, which is to with her powers of energy and creation and energetic transmission that we always associate with the Shakti. She wants to create all these different manifest worlds, all these different planes of existence. And then she and Shiva can play in those worlds as lovers. And Shiva raises the question with her, which is if his nature is always constant and is never changing, how can he be in her world? and in these worlds of existence. And she replies, based on the principle we just described, that he will always be in the center of all these parts of creation, and that around him, this dance of creation will always take place. So that around the essence of consciousness connected to the one is going to be the play of all the energies that's going to create all the manifest worlds and all the different things, all the different beings of creation. And so within the Indian tradition is one of the most beautiful descriptions that we have in any tradition of this primal interplay of consciousness and energy of the primal yin and yang polarities as they act out both within our own lives and in the world around us. And embedded in this knowledge is all types of deep spiritual principles. 
everything from practical work in Indian Tantra for the way that two human lovers interact and can raise their consciousness through their interaction to the way that we can work with structures in our own physical and energetic bodies or things outside of us. And we can always find a place that we can connect to the center, that we can connect to the primal source, to the primal bliss in the centers that are present in everything, which is a very important principle that again we go into in quite a bit of detail in a practical way in our Egyptian biogeometry courses. So this first sheath that we're talking about is the sheath of bliss. It is the uh, vehicle for the human being that's closest to the spiritual core and it has this blissful nature to it. Now from this Vedantic perspective of the five koshas, the next sheath as we come down toward the physical and more dense levels is called the Visnana Maya Kosha. And this means essentially the sheath of wisdom. This is a higher consciousness body that contains our discerning intellect and higher forms of knowledge. It's the higher mind that can really understand things of a spiritual nature. Some Indian commentators associate this with the high, higher level of us becoming conscious of ourselves as a separate individual being. Because these commentators see the Ananda Maya Kosha, the sheath of bliss, as being so close to the core of the human being that uh, it's hard to get a real separate sense of self at that level. It's at this level of the sheath of wisdom we begin to get a sense of separate self. The next sheath as we move downward into densification is the sheath of mind, the Manamaya Kosha. And this allows us to process the information brought in by the physical senses, the senses of the physical body, and that allows us to perceive and understand the physical world. The next sheath is the Pranamaya Kosha. And prana, of course, is the word in the Indian tradition for life energy, what we call the etheric in the West, or chi in China, is termed prana in India. And so the Pranamaya Kosha is the sheath of vital energy, the sheath of life energy. So this is the life force body that animates the physical body. And in the Indian tradition, within the yogic methods of initiation, they use the, the pranayama system to work with the breathing and to affect the pranic life body of the human being. And this can be used for all types of higher initiatory purposes. Now, the final of the five bodies is called the anamaya kosha. And anamaya kosha means literally the sheath made of food, because this is the physical body. And of course, we have to take part of the physical world to build up our own separate individual physical body. While we're an uh, embryo in the mother's womb, our mother takes in physical food, and then that connects to us through the umbilical cord, and it builds up our physical body in the womb through the food the mother takes in. Then after we're born into the world as a separate being, and of course all this is a metaphor for how we begin within the womb of the Godhead, and then we are put out into the world as a separate being. This is really a microcosm of that with mother and child. So when a child is born into the world as a separate being, then we take in food. First, the milk from the mother's breast, and then all the different food that's present for us in the world outside, and that food builds up our physical body. That's why in India they call this the sheath made of food. It is the dense physical body. It is a detachment from the physical world itself. In the Indian tradition, they understand that one of the most vital ways to work with the physical body is through the brain and the spine. And so many higher initiatory practices that you find in India are based on activations of energies and circulations within the cerebrospinal system. So, for example, in the high aspects of the Kriya Yoga system from the Himalayas, this has to do with learning how to run particular energies up and down the spine in particular patterns and connect to particular locations in the head that then accelerate human consciousness and human spiritual development. So these are the five subtle bodies or sheaths as seen from the Indian Vedantic system.